This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again to this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in the chapter of distillation and rectification. And in this video, I would like to derive formally what is called equimolar evaporation and condensation. I have discussed it already in relatively general terms in the previous videos, but here I want to formally, formally derive what that actually means and where that is coming from. In order to do that, we want to set up balances, because that's the tool we can use for that, and we want to set up the balances for this general stage, which carries the index n. We count the stages from top to bottom, so above that we have the stage n minus 1, so that the flow rate, the liquid flow rate coming from the stage above, carries that index n minus 1, l dot n minus 1, and from the stage below, which carries the stage index n plus 1, we have the vapor flow rate g dot n plus 1. Of course, with the corresponding compositions, that is here the x n minus 1 of component i, and here the y n plus 1 again of component i, of course, of all components actually. The flow rates that are leaving that stage are the index are carrying the index of that stage, that's our nomenclature, so to speak, so that is g dot n and that is l dot n, again with the corresponding compositions, the y n i and the x n i. And if you remember, equimolar evaporation and condensation meant that actually these two g dots, the g dot n and the g dot n plus 1 are identical, and that the l dot n minus 1 and the l dot n are identical. So we actually could, in principle, skip the indices for the flow rates, not for the compositions, but for the flow rates. In order to um, well, prove that, we, as I said, want to set up the balances. And we want to set up the balances on the one hand side for the overall flow rates, for the flow rates of the individual components, which are of course the flow rates times the corresponding mole fraction of that component. And we finally also want to set up the balance for the energy. And for the energy, the enthalpies are entering because they describe, so to speak, the energy flow with that uh, flow rate. Now we want to set up the balances and we want to assume for that what we have assumed actually for the Metcalfe-Teeter derivation already, and that is that the overall process is in steady state. Steady state means there is no change within, so the left side of the equal sign is is zero. There's no change with respect to time, no accumulation or anything within that theoretical stage. So the left side is zero. On the right hand side of the balance of this equal sign in the balance we have on the one hand side with a positive sign the entering streams the l dot n minus 1 and the g dot n plus 1 and the leaving streams with negative sign are the l dot n and the g dot n. Okay, now in principle let's, up, let's set up the balances, the three balances that I just mentioned. But before that I would like to introduce the definition of the enthalpies, or would like to well, come up with some equation for them to be able to describe them. Enthalpy. Actually we want to refer to the molar enthalpies and we want to uh, introduce, so to speak, our assumptions that we made with respect to the enthalpies. What did we say? We said that, for the assumptions, we said that the enthalpy of the mixture is described as an ideal enthalpy, or the mixture as an ideal mixture, which means that the mixture enthalpy, the molar mixture enthalpy, is just the mole fractions times the enthalpies of the pure components, which means we neglect all mixing enthalpies or ex um, uh, excess prop, uh, contributions to the enthalpy, which is of course the same, uh, so we skip those, we set them or assume that they are zero. That means that if we use an index L for a liquid, we have an HL. This is 
the molar enthalpy of the liquid mixture. So this refers to liquid mixture. That is equal, well, the summation over all components, that is I equals 1 to the number of components, which is K, times the mole fractions, times the molar enthalpies of the pure components in the same state, of course. So it is the sum over the Xi times the molar enthalpies of the pure components HIL. So that is the pure component enthalpy in the liquid state, weighted with the corresponding mole fraction, uh, summed over all components, and that is simply the enthalpy of the liquid mixture. So the HIL refers to the pure component. It's of course also liquid component. We want to assume the same thing for the vapor, but actually the mixing enthalpies are usually larger for the liquid, so that's the stronger assumption. For the vapor one can well, usually assume more or less under more or less ambient condition that that condition is fulfilled, that the vapor behaves ideal, so that the H of the vapor equals the sum over all components, I equals 1 to K, times the Yi, the mole fractions in the vapor, times the Hi in the vapor. I don't only have to mention here that this is now, of course, the vapor. So, that is the mixture, these are the pure components, and these are the mole fractions in the vapor. So we again sum up the individual molar enthalpies in the vapor state of the individual components multiplied with their corresponding mole fractions to yield the overall enthalpy, the molar enthalpy, of the mixture. So with these equations we want to describe the enthalpies in the energy balance. And now let's set up the balance. Three balances, I said. On the one hand side, we want to set up the balance for the overall flow rates, and I said we want to assume steady state. Steady state means left side of the equal sign equals zero. Zero equals what is entering. Well, what was that? Was what was entering? It was, was on the one hand side the L dot n minus one. Also entering was the G dot n plus one. And leaving streams were those that were carrying the index of the state regarded. That is the L dot n and the G dot n. So it's minus L dot n minus G dot n. This is for the overall flow rate. The second thing we want to write is the balance for an individual component i. Zero equals, well it's the same of course, multiplied with the corresponding mole fractions. So it is the x n minus 1 i of multiplied with the l n minus 1. So that is the flow rate of component i with the flow rate l dot n minus 1. What is also entering is of course the same for the vapor from stage n plus 1. So it's the y n plus 1 i times the g dot n plus 1. Same things, of course, for the leaving stream, so it's minus the x n i l dot n minus y n i times the g dot n. And that is now the balance for component i. And the last thing we want to set up is the energy balance. Again, we assume steady state, so no change with respect to time within the control volume equals, now it's the flow rates times the molar enthalpies. As I mentioned, we all, yeah, I want to express everything in moles, but you can do that on a mass basis as well, of course. Then you would have to use the specific enthalpies together with the mass flow rates. No problem, but you have to do it consistently. Anyway, what is entering is the L dot N minus 1, multiplied, of course, with the corresponding um, enthalpy, which is the H n minus 1 L, that's the molar enthalpy of the liquid stream entering from stage n minus 1, so from the top. Also entering is the G dot n plus run from the bottom times the corresponding enthalpy, molar enthalpy H n plus 1, of course, of the vapor, because G 
dot corresponds to vapor flow rate. And now the same thing for the leaving streams, which is just the L dot N times the H N of the liquid state minus the G dot N times the H N in the vapor state. So this index here refers to the stage we are regarding. I skipped that index actually up here, but of course, since I'm now taking into account the balance for the individual stages, I have to add that index to these equations, so to speak. And what we want to do now actually is to systematically plug one into equation into the next in order to come up with some overall solution. Oh, I first should write down that this is of course the energy balance. What energy balance means we have discussed previously already. So what we want to do now actually is we want to take these equations up here, the summations over the mole fractions multiplied with the corresponding molar enthalpies, and want to plug that into this equation to the energy balance. And of course then we find such a summation in either in each of the different terms, and so we can use we, we can compact the equation, we can collect, so to speak, the summation in front of all the individual terms and put the rest into brackets. So if we do that, what do we wind up with? My computer doesn't sometimes doesn't like me very much, so but now it works. So zero equals well summation over all components i equals one to k times well, big bracket, first of all. And what we have inside is, of course, now we want to substitute this Hn minus 1 of the liquid with this summation. So actually it is, well, first of all, this doesn't carry an index, so that first we have to write first. Then the, this H is then substituted by the summation, which we already have here, times the mole fraction times the molar enthalpy in the liquid state of the individual component. So we first have to write this L dot n minus 1 times the mole fraction, which is of course the x n minus 1 of component i times the enthalpy of component i in the liquid state. Now this is just plugging this into this equation. And of course, the enthalpy of the individual component here is independent, uh, so to speak, of the stage index. Well, actually, uh, one has to, one would have to take care of that a little bit more uh, carefully because actually this refers, of course, to the specified temperature and it's the temperature at that stage, so to speak. So that, that actually is a little bit more tricky than I explain it here, but in principle, we can uh, write it this way. If you would to do, want to do it with a simulation program or something like that, for example, we would have to take into account that this is a temperature function which we simply neglect at this point. The second thing that is entering is the g dot n plus 1 with the corresponding mole fraction y n plus 1 i times the corresponding enthalpy h i v. This is the same as before. This is just this g dot n plus 1 and this h n plus 1 v is substituted here, so it's the same thing with an additional index, the n plus 1 index is just the y n plus 1 i times the h of component i in the vapor. Again, we want to assume that that enthalpy is not a function of the individual stage index, so we assume that that is more or less constant and that we disregard the slight temperature dependence that there might be. Now, of course, the leaving streams, it's the L dot N times the corresponding composition, it's the X N I times the corresponding H I L minus the G dot of uh, stage N times the Y N I times the H I of the vapor. And of course, not to forget the closing brackets. So this means that uh, we have also substituted this enthalpy and that enthalpy by the corresponding summations. The summations, just to remember, uh, is written over here. Okay, so far so good. We realize already the things are getting a little bit more tedious now. Yeah? And it's the typical case, actually, you plug in one equation into the next and another one into that equation, so things tend to get a little bit large in the beginning, so we have very long equations, but if you did everything properly, 
then things collect or cancel so that in the end you wind up with a simple equation, usually at least. So for such typical things one has this expansion and then in the end it will contract to a very simple equation and we will see that in just a moment. Actually, if you are in the exam and you should derive something and if it does not collect in the end, it does, if it does not simplify, then possibly you have made an error somewhere. So just as a hint, so to speak. Okay, next thing now is that we want to uh, use the um, balance for the individual component. We want to solve that and plug it into this equation. This means, of course, that things are even getting more complicated. And what we actually want to do is we want to substitute, I have to check, we have to substitute this one, so we want to solve, so to speak, for this term, minus g dot n times y n i. g dot n y n min uh, n i. So we want to solve for this term here, which means that all the others have to be brought, brought to the other side of the equal sign, so this equals the rest with the opposite uh, sign. Writing that, it means minus y n i times g dot n equals now the say other terms with a negative sign so it is a, a minus x n minus 1 i l dot n minus 1 minus y n plus 1 i times g dot n plus 1 plus the x n i l dot n so these three terms have the opposite sign as these because we brought them to the other side of the equal sign. And now we want to substitute it in this equation and then of course things get a little bit lengthy. But nevertheless I hope that I can write everything on the screen so that we have everything together. So zero equals of course the summation over all components i equals 1 to k times big brackets. The first three terms you want to just copy and then substitute the last one. So let's first copy the first three terms. It's an L dot n minus 1, x n minus 1 i times h i l plus g dot n plus 1, y n plus 1 i h i v minus L dot n x n i times h i liquid. So this is a v. And now we come to this last term that we want to substitute and we have exactly this g dot n times y n i, negative sign, and we want to multiply that with the h i v. So we have to take these three terms with these signs and multiply each of them with the h i v and add that to this equation. So what we have is a minus, and I sort the the variable is the same way as the line above, so it's an L n minus 1, x n minus 1 i times the h i v. We wanted to multiply all these things with an h i v. Minus g dot n plus 1 times y n plus 1 i times the h i v plus the L dot n x n i times the h i v. V, because we wanted to multiply everything with the HIV here. And we realize, oh well, first of all, not forget the closing bracket. Now we want to look if there are some terms that are cancelling, and apparently there are some cancelling already. We see that this is the same as that with the opposite sign, so they simply cancel. So we can cross them out, they are gone. Okay, so things simplify already at this stage. Nice. Um, if we now collect the things, we saw that directly a little bit with respect to the flow rates. So we have, I should write that in blue again. No, no, no. As I said, my computer doesn't like me sometimes. So, and in blue. Zero equals. Of course, the summation, sum i equals 1 to k times. As I said, we wanted to sort that a little bit with respect to the flow rates. So we have the, uh, let's write it this way, minus 
xn minus 1i times the l dot n minus 1. So that is exactly corresponding to these two terms, so to speak, with a negative sign. So we have this in positive and that with a negative sign. So times this minus this, the hiv minus hil, yeah, because we have the negative sign here. So it's times hiv minus hil plus these terms here, which have the xn and the ln, so it is plus xni ln dot times, well, with a positive sign, so that is positive minus that, hiv minus hil. hiv minus hil. Big closing bracket. And at that point, we realize actually our assumption, we realize that that actually is the delta hv of component i, and of course that is the H, uh, delta hv of component i, which is the enthalpy of vaporization, the molar enthalpy of vaporization of each component, but we actually said, we in the assumptions, we want to assume that the enthalpy of vaporization is identical for all components. So these are identical and so for all components, and that is simply the delta Hv. Let me write it this way. And then, of course, we can again uh, look at our variables that we have. So we have a delta Hv here, a delta Hv here, here, and well, we could directly see that we can simplify that, but let me do it step by step. That's also a re recommendation, for example, for exa exams, if you have to derive things, better write one more equation that avoids problems and errors that you can make otherwise. Uh, errors with the sign or something, there are many possibilities to write something in the wrong way. So we simply, uh, well, we simply write it again. Zero equals summation over i equals 1 to k times and I simply stupidly write it minus x n minus 1 i times the L dot n minus 1 times the delta H v plus the x n i L dot n delta H v. And in this equation we actually realize that the number of variables doesn't carry the index i. You know, the L dot and the delta H v, the L dot n minus 1, and the delta HV, they don't carry an index. Yeah, so we can actually pull them in front of the corresponding sum. Yeah, that means that we can write also 0 equals minus L dot N minus 1 delta HV times the summation I equals 1 to K X N uh, minus 1 I plus the L dot N times the delta HV times the summation I equals 1 to K X N I. Well, you know, of course, the sum over all mole fractions, over all components, is unity, here as well as there. Well, so this means that we simply have 0 equals minus L dot N minus 1 delta HV plus L dot N delta H V. And now we simply assume that the delta H V, the enthalpy of vaporization, is a non-zero quantity, which it, which it is of course, it's non-zero. And so we simply divide by that variable. So what we wind up with, and we can do that in one step hopefully, we can simply write L dot N equals L dot N minus one. That's actually exactly what we wanted to show. So we see, with these assumptions, we directly wind up with this uh, fact that the flow rates don't change across this individual stage that we have been balancing. And now finally we plug this into the overall balance. We wrote that down, so we will be using that as well. Let me scroll up and let's have a look at the overall balance. Oops, where am I? I said my computer doesn't like me sometimes. Interesting. Anyway, 
Uh, this is the overall balance and we see that these two are identical, so this simply cancels and what that means of course that 0 equals g dot n plus 1 minus g dot n. Oh, come on. 0 equals uh, g dot n plus 1 minus g dot n or of course g dot n plus 1 equals g dot n. And that's exactly what we wanted to show for equimolar evaporation condensation. Let's look what that actually means. It means actually that this flow rate is identical to that and that flow rate is identical to that. And I should stress that again, of course, the compositions change along the distillation column because, I mean, that's the separation effect that you want to achieve. But nevertheless, the flow rates, the overall flow rates are identical. So we can simply skip the index and call that g dot and call this l dot, simplifying the nomenclature. But we have to take into account that this only holds if we have a stage like that with a vapor going, get going in, vapor going out, liquid going in, liquid going out. As soon as we have an additional flow rate entering or leaving, that is a feed or also a side withdrawal of vapor or liquid, in any of these cases, this doesn't hold anymore. We would have to account for this additional flow rate. And that means, of course, that in our entire column, which is shown here, we have to take into account that up here the flow rates are different from the flow rates down there because in between we have the feed. And this means, of course, directly that we have a different variable actually. And so we have L dot and G dot over here and L dot prime and G dot prime down here. So in the stripping section, the variables are carrying a prime and in the rectifying section, they don't. So it's L dot G dot in the rectifying section, L dot prime and G dot prime in the stripping section. And it's only distinguished by that stage where the feed is entering. So the nomenclature changes at the stage of the feed. With that, let me summarize. We have seen equimolar condensation and evaporation. We have seen that that actually means that the flow rates are constant along the column, at least in each column section. And to stress that again, the concentrations of course change from stage to stage because that is our separation effect that we want to achieve in the end. And we have discussed how that works in principle already a little bit with the uh, distillation cascades. With that take home message I want to finish for today and hope that you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much.